we really believe that it's possible to unlock the whole human potential. In Damanor, we believe that there are multiple lines of reality. And so imagine that one of these lines of reality has led humanity to destroy our planet, has led us to a point of no return. We believe that we can create a new branch in time, whereby events will go differently and we will not destroy ourselves and the planet. It was important for us to make something solid, visible, touchable, because otherwise it's only theoretical. We have people doing magic in their daily life. One of my great fascinations in life has been the origins of humankind. Every now and again I come across a body of work that both deepens my understanding and validates what I've already learned. While at the Edgar Cayce Institute, I had the opportunity to speak with John Van Auken, who is a Cayce scholar, having studied the works for more than 40 years. John offers us a glimpse into our development as a species, as few do, and one that I resonate with deeply. I'd like to talk about the origins of the human species are multidimensional origins, so we can talk about where we came from, what we descended to, and most, to me most importantly, what we are emerging back into as of who we truly are. Mm -hmm. So let's just start with the beginning. <clears throat> All right. Well, from Edgar Cayce's perspective, there was an involution into matter before the evolution up through matter. So even though all of us are very familiar with the evolution, not too many of us are aware of the involution out of energy, mind, spirit, into matter. And that we existed for a long time, long before we became physical and into these physical vehicles that we use the mind, the spirit, the life essence, or as the Egyptians call it, the Ka, existed long before. Then some of us, not all of the children of God, came into the physical dimension, gradually made a transition, and Edgar explains it was like the crystallization of thought. Thought took on thought form, and we manifested into the form. And like Carl Jung talks about, at some point we only projected a portion of our whole being. And so behind the veil we have to get in touch with the other portion of us if we want full consciousness. And that's been true really from the beginning of our, in, in our physical flesh incarnations is we've never, we, well, some, some people have been able to connect with and bring through their full being. Yes. But not most. And so let's talk about what happened then through the early stages of uh, the development of the human society consciousness, maybe starting with, uh, with Mu or mm -hmm. Lemuria. Uh -huh. Well, on the descent out of spirit into matter or out of pure energy into matter, we had great awareness of the forces of nature and the cosmos. And so that's why when you look around our planet, you see all these megalithic structures of such sophisticated construction and engineering and oriented towards celestial events. What were these primitives doing? I mean, according to evolution, they should be planting corn and they're out there building megalithic structures oriented to celestial objects and events and uh, important uh, cycles. This, according to Casey, was the period in which great wisdom and high cultural sophistication occurred. However, he says we weren't as dense in matter as we are now. So it might be tricky finding bones of us. Mm -hmm. when Good actually, point. Yeah, when actually there might be more of us in spirit, in subtle matter. In fact, 
Lemuria is believed to have gotten its name from lemur, but not the little creature in Madagascar. Lemur also means ghost. And that was more likely our nature. We were like ghost spirits. But we were able to function, to move the forces of matter using cosmic energies and all. And we could move stones that weighed 70 tons to build the Great Pyramid's King's Chamber or other structures, you know. Uh, the obelisk of uh, Hatshepsut mm -hmm. in Karnak is still an engineering marvel. How could they even raise it? It weighs so much and is so tall. It would break if you tried to just raise it. How could all of this occur? We understood those forces back then. The deeper you moved into matter, the more you lost awareness of the cosmic dynamics and your connection or harmony with nature forces. And then you became more physical and these things became very difficult to build. You've been featured on Ancient Aliens because you understand the Casey readings in, in, in a lot of very complex manners. And this might be a good place to ask you, oftentimes these various feats that would have required other technologies and understanding of cosmic forces and the movement of energy that were employed for feats as what you just spoke of are attributed to visiting third dimensional alien species. Mm -hmm. Now where does what you're saying dovetail with some of that? Well, uh, fortunately Zachariah Sitchin and I had many conversations about aliens. Oh you did, you, oh, yeah. oh, you got into it with him. We had a good fortune to share a lot of our thoughts and he really appreciated Edgar's perspective uh, and also Edgar's timing which is often more ancient than most archaeologists yes. would accept. The key perspective from Casey is definitely there are aliens to this planet. He even gave a little reading for a Mayan princess who had reincarnated and said that she was in the Mayan lands when this planet was being visited from other worlds, other planets. They do exist. However, the factor we miss often is that we were those aliens. Yes. Yes. And that's, now, a, that's a very important point. Yeah, very important point. <laughs> There's right. no one native to this planet. <laughs> right. Right. That is very true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we are very, and my understanding also is depending on the individual you're, that's sitting in front of you, you could have had your origins in many different ways yes. and be here and now human. We're all yeah. kind of in the same dilemma now, right. encased in this body, trying to figure out where we came from, what we're doing here, and how to get back. Right, exactly. In fact, Edgar Casey would sometimes start one of his psychic readings by saying, oh, a Uranian, how refreshing. <laughs> and the lady would say, no, I was from New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> no, your soul was from way out there. <laughs> well, let me ask you that. I mean, this is a little, we're, we're going off the track just a, a bit, but not really. What kind of influences was he seeing in individuals in terms of various kind of star seed or, or planetary sourcing, so to speak? The uniqueness of Edgar Casey was that he didn't just focus on reincarnation in previous lives. Mm -hmm. He focused on what he called sojourns in other realms. Yes. When we're not here, it's not like we're in stasis or some suspended state. We're active elsewhere in the cosmos. We're children of the celestial realms, and so we can be very active. So for him, he could sense that you were going through the stargate of Arcturus, and you would say, but no, I was in bed in my home last night. He would say, no, your soul was free in doing this. But when uh, death occurs, you also can do that and have experiences elsewhere. Prior to coming here, you've had experiences all over the universe. You're part of the infinite, but now you're finitely expressed. But that infinite influence is still with you. And Edgar saw that. And that becomes very confusing to people who are readers who don't understand this, who are reading for other individuals intuitively. And they oftentimes will go off on tangents because, oh goodness, I see you from this, this other planetary system. Mm -hmm. That could be between lives prior to the existence right. on Earth, dream time or anything. Yes, exactly. Okay. 
Exactly. In fact, Casey would say not everything is karma from a previous life. A lot of what you have in your energetics and your urges and dynamics are celestial experiences that influence you. And that's why he thought, like Carl Jung, the depth psychologist, thought that astronomical um, dynamics were important to an individual because not because of where the star was when they were born, but because the individual experienced that planet dimension mm -hmm. or that star constellation, which we call the sign. And all of these things actually came from the Pleiades or something and had that experience within them now incarnate. So not everything was past life. It could be what you did in these sojourns elsewhere. Well, when we're looking then at our emergence or our evolution through into and through the physical and these various other influences that have come along and have always been with us on Earth, including other third dimensional entities with spaceships that are advanced yeah. and sophisticated. Mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of different theories. If you go to the conspiracy community, you're going to hear that there are races from other planetary systems that sought to exploit the nature of our forgetfulness and keep human consciousness constricted. First of all, what are your thoughts on that? Um, aliens are not innately brilliant. <laughs> they are just like us. Some yes. of us have got it together and some of us are <laughs> wacky way out lost. Uh, there's free will in all the entities in the whole cosmos and you have to understand that just because they're speaking from another dimension doesn't mean they're that much brighter than you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so caution is called for. So yes, exploitation is certainly a possibility. Yes. We do it to each other, we do oh, it to yes. other species, other species do it to us and yes. have done it to us. Yes. And so we look at that and oftentimes a lot of energy has gone in recent times to trying to figure that piece out and how do you resist and grow beyond those the stranglehold other species may have over our developing consciousness but in truth there has to be a much more efficient way to move beyond any kind of challenge that could be out there because uh -huh. there's certainly plenty of the other right. assisting right. can you talk to us now about let's go a little further into Atlantis and through the Atlantean times Egypt and kind uh -huh. of emerging back yeah. with some of those forces and beyond well, uh, interesting, as the Hopi legends hold, the door to the other dimensions was open in the ancient times. You could come and go, mm -hmm. unlike the way it is today where you are sealed into this physical vehicle once your soft spot seals over yeah. in your baby body, you're encased for an incarnation. According to these ancient legends, that was not the case in ancient times. So you could manifest here and sojourn and be active and dynamic, meet others, develop relationships with them. But you could also withdraw. Edgar used the phrase for an Atlantean priestess one time. He said, she withdrew to the deeper meditations in Jupiter. Uh -huh. And everybody goes, what? <laughs> What's that mean? <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that's what you could do in those days. It's different now. We've come very deep into matter. We are really encased in matter, and it requires a lot of practice and development and soul growth in order and mental expansion in order to feel the true self free of matter. Yes. But even the uh, Hopi legend says the door was closed and so now it's it's even harder to do. Uh, but that's going to change. The new age that's coming is an age of release of the bondage of matter and physicality and self consciousness into more luminescence, expansive consciousness. And Edgar actually says the people of the earth are going to meet the people of the universe. Mm -hmm. Now that's interesting because I thought we were the only ones mm -hmm. around oh. there. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, okay, so when in the Casey readings as we go through this period of this where we were much more expanded and still had the ability to, to come and go, so to speak, um, there were these cycles that happened, these cycles of greed, of corruption, of destruction, some of it natural, some of it not natural. And I think he, tell me if I'm wrong on this, did he say that the Atlantean cultures were um, reconstructed and, and then fell three times? Yeah. 
You're exactly right. Edgar Cayce's story of Atlantis is a story of high, marvelous, idealistic culture around 200,000 BC. But gradually, um, reaching closer to 50,000 BC, it lost its way. It became more violent, more self-centered, more aggressive, more dense into matter, and their beautiful crystal that they had used for healing and rejuvenation became the death ray. They started to use it to kill, to destroy, instead of all the healing and the illumination. Edgar said they could touch the crystal and their minds could expand into the collective conscious, the universal. They could put their bodies uh, near the radiation of the crystal that was being channeled and rejuvenate the cells of their body. But eventually, in, as they deteriorated in their awareness, they began to use the radiation coming through the crystal to actually destroy things. Uh, was this more having to do with competition, military, commerce, uh, domination of land mass? Exactly. It had more to do with um, this development of uh, we and them mm -hmm. when all was actually one. Mm -hmm. The development of mine and yours, mm -hmm. and mine is always bigger than yours, mm -hmm. and that energy started to uh, distort their awareness of this harmonic oneness and they became more individualized and in that case they could turn others into the enemy mm -hmm. and destroying them was just uh, what you did because they justified it you justified it right okay and uh, I really should have asked you one other thing prior to this but it's not a bad time to ask and that is okay as we look at what was happening to the psyche of humankind during Atlantis what happened with Lemuria, toward the end of Lemuria? Because my understanding is it actually bridged over into the yes. Atlantean period. Yeah, you're correct. Uh, in the Casey model or story, Lemuria or Mu mm -hmm. was the most ancient location of the first contact on this planet and the culture developed there and it was high level culture. But we were more like spirits. We weren't real physical beings, more like ghosts or spirits. Um, <clears throat> Atlantis developed a long time later. Lemuria went on for, according to Casey, millions yes, of years. Yes, many millions, yes. Yeah, but Atlantis only a few hundred thousand years. But Atlantis developed to develop a physical vehicle. Now, the Mayans tell the story this way. Uh, the children of God withdrew into the seven caves to powwow with Mother God as to the situation they had gotten into. And they told her, we're in trouble here. And she said, you need a perfect vehicle, a, f a perfect form. And this is in Lemurian times still. Yes, yes. still in Lemuria. Yes, yes. But the Atlantean development of the perfect body was what the Mayans called the blue maze people, perfect in every way. And that was the first physical vehicle that was uh, ideally arranged for the children of God to use rather than the various animals and plant kingdom they used their material forms but there was no material form for these uh, children of God these spirits of the Creator they um, required a different arrangement but the Creator according to Casey never thought they'd even want to come to this mundane world mm -hmm. <laughs> there was some confusion there yeah. this was an interesting experiment <laughs> right but when it became evident they wanted to come here, a form had to be made for them to manifest three-dimensionally. And that was, in the legend of the Maya, the Blue Maze people. Very interesting. Perfect in every way. I had an experience years ago where I was taken into a far memory that shocked me, where I was a young male, and it was a time before eyesight had developed fully full spectrum of color. Mm. It didn't have full spectrum. Everything was beige and brown. The only color there was a little bit of purple, and that was mm. in the large bird, much larger than a condor. Mm. And I used to, for kicks, <clears throat> set my body down and then get out of the body and go with the bird and by, with permission we'd fly around together. Mm -hmm. And you could see other birds who were being occupied in the same way mm -hmm. and <clears throat> then come back. The thing about going into far memory is sometimes you don't exactly know where you were. Uh -huh. I've always guessed it was probably Lemurian times right. 
which would that have been when this kind of thing was possible for us to do? Yeah, exactly. That's what Casey said. Okay. The spirits uh, having no physical vehicle would move their essence and their sensory perception into an existing physical form in this dimension, mm -hmm. such as a bird, uh, such as half horse, half man, you know, uh, all of these sort of creatures in our mythology were this sort of merging and that couldn't be because the arrangement was everything was supposed to give seed to itself. So we needed an ideal vehicle for these spirits to use rather than those that belong That's to the right, felines to or the canines. Yeah, you're That's not rude. Supposed to, you're not right? supposed to be riding in them, but it was fun. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Just for brief periods, right. no harm done. Uh -huh. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so now we go back through the Atlantean period. We see the evolution of consciousness and selfishness, greed, my, me, you, and uh, now we're starting to get into territory that feels more familiar to us. So let's talk about the migration then after the Atlantean period into Egypt mm -hmm. and what was really trying to be redeemed during that period. We uh -huh. always think of Egypt as bringing great darkness, but there were beautiful light cycles oh, there. Yeah. One of the key transitions occurred in Atlantis in 106,000 BC. And it was the desire to manifest the yin and yang in individual forms instead of a hermaphroditic mm -hmm. singular form. And Edgar Cayce's readings tell us the story that the yin was separated out and given a form that reflected the yin. And therefore, a woman's body, everything is internalized. She is within the cycles of the moon. She conceives within herself. She gestates in the hidden place of her womb. The child grows. Life is in there. It comes out. Then she brings forth nourishment from within. All this is the wind. The male form, the yang form, was projected with the phallus, the idea of he's the sword carrier, the plower of the field, and all of this dynamic externalized energy. These were the yin and yang separated into individual forms. At first this was a good idea because like in Genesis the Lord said they are lonesome here. So he casts a deep sleep over the androgynous Adam and pulls out the feminine. And the Hebrew word used when they first pull her out is kava which means the life giver. And that's for all of us that's our intuitive deep inner self. John has authored 17 books on Casey's work as well as appearing on several DVDs. I highly recommend that you go to his website at johnvanauken.com or to edgarcasey.org to connect with his body of work. In addition, he's created his own system of reaching into your soul for your greater understanding, which you can also find on his website. Meanwhile, you might also enjoy my interview with Sidney Kirkpatrick, who chronicled the life of Edgar Casey in fascinating detail. Until next time, thanks for watching CMN. Common people around the world are doing the uncommon. I mean, it is literally the Netflix of spirituality.